get frisky. It's like, can I actually <laughs> pull off a piece with a dead pink unicorn in it? I would seriously like to try. And uh, in this case, I just completely uh, <laughs> did something off. This is on the left. It's an original stained glass window from a church in Tattersall, England. Uh, Cromwell's troops destroyed a lot of stained glass, and they later they didn't have like board up service, so uh, they just dig them up and put them back together, but not in the right order. And uh, some of those windows are so amazing. You don't see a lot of well, you do now that there's an internet. There's easy access to tons of this stuff, but I never saw it until I was like 45 years old. I had no idea, and it's quite amazing. So uh, I particularly adore that window on the left, so I, I remade it my way. I have a vast uh, collection of images uh, very carefully put into file folders, like people standing on the edge of a cliff. Uh, so it, because I can't have my own ideas, I have to have these folders so that I can have, get one. Handily. That's where ideas come from. They come from folders on hard drive. <laughs> and my sketch is on the <coughs> bottom here. That's it's not it's a big sketch. It's not quite that big. But I think I have a picture of the, the girl. I changed the girl. Yeah, I do. I actually made this girl in stained glass. This is what happens in my studio. These figures, I make them, and they sit around in Tupperware bins fully made in stained glass because I don't know how I want to finish the window. It took me something like six years to get to this figure and finish it. She just sat in a box until inspiration struck or a show deadline came up, which is a synonym for inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second, perhaps the first most important way I have ideas is that I don't have ideas. I actually literally draw them out of me. I constantly draw, and this is where I, I could, these are my teenage drawings. I was uh, persecuted as a uh, childhood artist for constantly drawing all over my papers, which would come back with uh, red marks on them saying, stop drawing all over your papers. And so when I was an art student and a painting major, I was in this very sort of inhibited search for, for like what would be my personal voice, but I was searching externally. And I was looking to see what my influences were, and I was painting kind of like Giotto, because I really like Giotto. And I was uh, constantly doing this, uh, painting like Francis Bacon, because I like Francis Bacon. Meanwhile, uh, I was also painting over the parts that weren't very good with gesso, and then I would always have a blank canvas at the end of the day. It was just this sort of perpetual creative honesty nightmare. <laughs> so in stained glass, which I figured was sort of, you know, right above the department of hairstyling, um, that clearly doesn't matter in this world. So when I went into that class, I brought this stuff, which also clearly had no place in this world. And when I made the connection between those drawings and this material of glass, and uh, I became uh, uncritiquable. That's what you all want, students, if you're art students. Mm -hmm. The moment when nothing anyone says affects you in any way because, <laughs> because of passion. I, I was so in love with this. And as someone with ADD, if you have ADD, you'll, you'll relate to this. I thought, this is the thing that will never be born. And of course, I have found a way to make it boring. I, uh, um, but unfortunately, I became fluent, and then it was too late. Uh, so I still draw. That's the, uh, it's a little hard to see, isn't it? That's the craft faculty uh, meeting agenda for uh, some faculty meeting. I find faculty meetings to be the most inspiring thing in the whole wide world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think they are incredible. But the craft conference in Minnesota a few years back, uh, I, I did 300 bird drawings in three days or something crazy like that. So that was really good, too. Best conference ever. I bet they put this stuff into Photoshop and sort of get rid of the text. Because if there's one thing I understand is that text doesn't matter. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> this is 
based on that doodle on the right. You know, I'm actually extremely interested in the connection between um, image and words. My, I, I, this is part of my typical lecture, but I didn't include it here. My brother is uh, autistic, and he uh, didn't learn to speak until he was about 11. And my mother was a social worker, and very, very interested in neurology and human brains. And I remember her asking me, like, would you rather be blind or deaf? And I said, oh, definitely deaf, because I'm planning on being a painter. And uh, <laughs> she was like, no, you're actually better off being blind, because you need to have language to be an artist. And I'm like, say what? Um, <laughs> but I think, I think that relates to the child who's raised in isolation, uh, you know. Like, it has to do with, um, reaching what Lacan would call the symbolic stage, but we won't go into that today. You know, I put this in this lecture, and I really had to struggle, so I included these doodles so I could say how I drew this on a cocktail napkin, which is basically true. But the real reason I put it in here is I think this is one of my most beautiful pieces ever, and because the theme is beauty, I just wanted to show this uh, beautiful thing. I still think this is one of my most beautiful pieces. There's the doodles. And if you could turn it into a cylinder, it would be just one image. But don't you be doing that in stained glass and it doesn't bend. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my sketchbooks have reached this sort of crazy situation where it, you know, I used to get like really big, beautiful sketchbooks with acid-free paper, and then I realized that when the sketchbook didn't fit on the table next to the couch, I wouldn't bother to stand up and reach three feet to get it. So it had to fit on the table next to me, or I wouldn't sketch. I don't care how ridiculous that sounds. I'm all about working with my ADD, not against it. So little sketchbook, OK. And then I couldn't deal with white pages anymore. So I get lined pages. And I don't like the idea of acid-free, because if it's precious, then I'm going to make a big, I can't make a mess. I get all inhibited. Just the way I did in painting class when I was thinking about art history. So I work on the most horrible sketchbooks possible. So this drawing on the uh, on the right led to this piece here, which was based on um, the idea of the odalisk, the um, odious odalisk, a tradition that really just doesn't look good in light of today's culture. Oopsie. Anyway, mine's far too sexy, but she does have a funny face. <clears throat> Ignore the caption at the top. Um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about was the, uh, <laughs> this. Um, I do a lot of stuff, <clears throat> and it doesn't come out right. It uh, occurs to me lately that uh, I used to get very angry with myself because I sometimes make these pieces several times, but then at one point it dawned on me that I would not necessarily know how to make it since this thing didn't exist in the world before. So why should I be any different than the rest of anyone? So I don't know what it's supposed to look like. All right, now I'm just going to talk about technical stuff because people always want to know, and I did bring some samples with me that we can look at after the lecture if you're interested. So my pieces are not painted, but I'm going to just be misleading and start off with a piece that is all painted. So this is what it looks like finished, and this is what it looked like in progress. I sandblasted the glass with those silhouettes of those women to give it a texture, frosted, and sandblasting frosted glass. And then I drew the sketch on it with a Sharpie pen, and I covered it with glass paint, and with the glass paint, I went carefully over those lines and painted those dark lines, and I fired it in a kiln. The second pass with the paint looked like that. I go into the paint, and I remove some of it, and then I add more, and ultimately, it looked kind of like that. Those weird bubbles are um, a thing called matte painting. You basically paint the glass paint on, with this thing called a badger blender, and you squirt it with Windex, and when it dries, you brush it all off, and it makes those weird bubbles. All right, this piece, which is about a bear stealing a baby. You can read into that what you want. <laughs> I'm going to show you the section of the girl holding the lantern. <clears throat> the glass is engraved in layers. 
the glass has two layers of color on it. I'm going to go over here and scream really loud. This is all of them together, and this is a piece of glass that, when I get it from uh, New Jersey, where glass is made, I'm just kidding, where glass is imported from Germany, um, it would be a sheet about so big that looks bright red. And this would be a sheet the same size that looks bright blue, and the other one would be a sheet that looks pink. Now the secret to this glass is that it contains two layers of color, and you can remove what? And I remove it with various tools, like sandblasting. And in this case, I covered it with Elmer's glue. I just squirted it on, and wherever the glue is, it won't sandblast. And I also use hand-cut stencils made out of contact paper. Anything that's black is painted on with that paint that fires on, so this shadow. And this yellow stuff, I would like to say it's silver stain, but it's not. It's actually some sort of yellow, transparent paint. But uh, silver, I do use silver stain, and in the next piece I used it. And it's worth noting, silver stain is where the term stained glass comes from. It's just silver nitrate. It, you fire it on in a kiln at about 1,000 degrees, and it stains the glass yellow. So here is this piece called Feral Child, and I will show you the area of the birds on the top. <clears throat> on the left top there is what it looked like when I first sandblasted it, and then on the left bottom, I go into it with various engraving tools, basically dentist drills, and they sound like dentist drills, and if I was weird, I would say, oh, why? But there's no one there but me. <laughs> so, the red glass has all the paint on it and all the silver stain, and there's a pink glass layer and a blue glass layer, and when you put it all together, it looks like that. There is nothing else going on there. I do not paint the colors on. I am removing the colors. And here's a close-up of the face, and this is the face taken apart. Now, Sharon, I was much taken with your discussion of what the planet looks like from an airplane at night because I actually think that's one of the most beautiful sights to hold. And as it turns out, that's Berlin. It didn't matter that that was Berlin. It was just the biggest JPEG on the internet that I could use for this. <laughs> but I'm going to show you the, how the figure is engraved from beginning to end. It's all in the slide. <laughs> um, so I sandblast a little bit the blue. I draw on it with a magic marker where I want to engrave it, and then I engrave it with these tools. The tones are done with a hand file. It looks like a nail file. I have one with me. I'll show you. <laughs> it's really not interesting. Well, it's interesting to me. It looks like this. It looks like a little stick. You can all fondle the stick. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting there showing this to a student, and you basically you go like this for like two weeks. That figure took two weeks to make, and it's about this big. And he was a film student, and he looked at me and he said, do you really enjoy that? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Do I have any time left? Yeah, you can. Okay, so people ask me why glass, and I agree, why glass? This is the trajectory of the history of my medium. Sad, isn't it? <laughs> there is something in it. <laughs> um, anyone who works in glass will like to tell you that they've chosen glass because it's just so completely perfect with their conceptual program. However, they're lying. Everyone likes glass because it transmits light, and if you don't like transmitted light, that means that you were born on another planet. One without a sun. As I mentioned before, um, glass art cures the following conditions. <laughs> All this is leading me to discuss my project at Eastern State Penitentiary, which was the only time my work was ever installed in architecture. This is an old engraving. It is the oldest penitentiary in the United States, meaning place of penance. And it's now a tourist site in Philadelphia. You should all come. It's where they built 12 monkeys. <clears throat> and it's an active arts uh, uh, venue. I proposed to make 10 stained glass windows, and I ended up making 17, which I installed in the stalls, in the cells, rather, which looked like mini chapels. 
Unfortunately, the pieces had to be removed, and I then put surrounds around them that would sort of imitate the uh, sounds so that they would be autonomous from the site-specific installation. Yes, it did cast beautiful colored shadows. And look, it's this piece. This happens to be one of my favorite pieces I've ever made. Um, and you can see it was really skinny. The only the tiny strip in the middle fit into the cell uh, window. But I was so excited by the image, I, I finished it out as a large piece. The position of the figure is based on the girl who's been napalmed in Vietnam. You all recognized it, right? Right. We've seen that photo. <coughs> I also did a really giant window, which I wasn't going to do, but Sean Kelly told me it would be my masterpiece. And then I said to myself, what does he know about my masterpiece? What's, what's a masterpiece? You know, some pressure there. And then I just couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about it, and uh, I decided I had to do it. And this, this piece changed my life. I literally became the person who had to have pizzas and matzo slid under the crack beneath their door. I totally changed my life. I no longer have any social life whatsoever. Uh, after making this piece, <laughs> I just ended my life. Because um, I only had six months to make it, and it's humongous. It was based loosely on this painting by a boy we'll called the Battle of Carnival in Lent, which is basically an image of Mardi Gras. Here's it was supposed to be the seven cardinal sins versus the seven deadly, seven cardinal virtues versus the seven deadly sins. However, I do not believe in that. I just don't believe in good versus evil. It's just a lot of gray areas. That figure on the bottom is actually a Matthew Brady photograph of a dead soldier in the Antietam, but he didn't have those cool pants, <laughs> nor was it in color. And I was also loosely thinking about the idea of angel versus devil on one shoulder and sort of the idea that anyone who might have found themselves incarcerated in a real penitentiary or maybe just in one of their own making would have somehow lost that battle. <coughs> um, all right, so taking after that, that installation came down, this was the only window, by the way, that wasn't one of those really skinny ones. So I was really tired of working with these really skinny things, and I couldn't indulge my fetish for insane detail, except with this piece. So I want you to just hold this image in your mind, and then hold these two images in your mind. And then this was the next piece I did after Eastern State Penitentiary, which is a sort of mashup of those influences there. And I have a technical slide to show the layers separated. This, the drawing alone took months. It just seemed to really, there's no such thing as too much work for me. I could, I could do it, I could go in further and deeper more. I could sandblast by throwing a single grain of sand in the glass and sandblast. <laughs> I am not someone who is obsessed with horses, except that I got really interested in images of horses in art. <clears throat> And here's this piece separated out with the colors. And here's the horse. I feel like I should hurry it up. Um, I do post work in progress to Instagram on the day. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, this is The Birth of Eve, another piece that I think is uh, beautiful. I was calling it, look, Ma, no rib. I'm not, I'm not Christian, by the way. I'm not religious at all. My father was Jewish, and my mother was Christian, so I have like uh, no religious affiliation myself. <clears throat> One thing that's become increasingly important to me is the idea of spontaneity. I don't work with drawings for these for the most part. It depends. I have at times worked with drawings. So the top part of this one is, was pretty much all improvised. The uh, Gothic image on the right is a anchorite. Anchorites were a sect that would um, voluntarily get bricked into the wall because they believed in solitude to that extent. Here's the figure. She was actually originally on that piece that I showed you when I was talking about those cosmic maps. But she didn't look good there, so she had to be moved. <laughs> and here's the pieces with the the layers set. 